Hello, I'm Joe, and I'm with Cordev uh, Tomek uh, from Parity, and we're going to talk about the transaction queue today. Hey, Joe. So first of all, what is a transaction queue, and like how is it used in a blockchain? Mm -hmm. So a transaction queue is a is a component of the substrate node of the of the blockchain client that is responsible to um, uh, track all the transactions that we see that we see in the network, and the network layer is actually feeding the transaction queue with all the transaction it sees, and then. The, the task of the transaction queue is to figure out if that transaction is uh, is still valid if it's if it could be in, uh, in uh, could be part of the next block that we are producing and also the second task it's doing is for all the valid transactions that we see uh, let's say we see like you know hundred thousand transactions floating in the network and when we are producing a new block as a validator, uh, which of those transactions should actually go first to the to this next block? Because then the next block might have some fixed capacity. You can only include 10,000 uh, 10, transactions. So you have a way to decide which of them should go first and, and which should go later. Yeah, and it's also deciding like which transactions could be valid in the future, right? Because you could have an account that's at some nonce and you receive a transaction for like a nonce plus three. Mm -hmm. It's not valid now, but you don't really want to throw it away. Like you want to save it, right? Exactly. So so the transaction queue inside Substrate is actually very generic. So it doesn't even deal with, uh, with accounts or uh, with transaction fees or anything like that. Uh, or nonces, uh, you can build a UTXO chain on top of Substrate and the transaction pool will be able to handle that. It's the runtime telling the transaction queue uh, what ordering of transaction is, uh, transactions is, is valid. And uh, by default, if you are building your runtime with frame, uh, then yes, we are using the account uh, model. So we have accounts and nonces, which means that transactions com coming from the same account and having different nonces needs to be included in order. So it's like an you know transaction index, like a sequential number uh, of a transaction. Then uh, the pool needs to check if the if the fees are uh, can be covered by the by the account balance, and uh, a bunch of different things that are uh, implemented and in the runtime itself. Yeah, so there's like a big part of this logic that's in the client that people don't really have to worry about, like if they're building their blockchain you have a transaction queue, right? So um, for people who are doing that, like, what do they need to know about the transaction queue? Mm -hmm. So basically they need to know that it, uh, it is being directed by the, by the runtime. So uh, the transaction pool will do whatever the runtime tells them, so uh, that tells it. So, so uh, it's the runtime developers that need to take care about what is the priority of my transactions error or uh, when when the transaction becomes invalid, uh, where it should be removed from the pool and so on. Um, we can jump to the code real quick. And um, if we go to the example runtime that we have in the, in the um, Substrate repo in Node, um, there is a function called validate transaction. Yeah, so basically the transaction queue that we have implemented in Substrate relies on that, that method. So you as a runtime developer, you need to implement this validate transaction. And this tells all the details about the transaction to the transaction pool. Let's quickly jump to this transaction validity. Um, transaction validity. Oh, sorry, uh, I need to jump to a different file. Yep. And Scroll down a little bit, maybe. Sorry. Okay, so we should have a structure. Maybe I'll look at. Wait. Wait, it's not here. Transaction validity. Oh, it's valid transaction. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is what I was looking for. So this is what the runtime tells uh, the, the transaction queue. So uh, it tells that priority, it tells the required tags, which is uh, the dependencies between transactions. It tells the longevity and if the transaction should be propagated or not. Yeah, so the runtime has to 
compute all the fields for the struct and put it together. And then when it submits a transaction into the pool, it has to kind of hand this struct off with it. So the pool knows what to do with it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and so like, um, can we just go through some of these like priority? This is uh, like would a higher number indicate that it has higher priority? Um, so it's going mm -hmm. to be included sooner and then requires, um, what does this mean? Does it mean like some? Uh, yeah, so um, um, this tells what transactions should go first before that transaction is uh, is allowed to go to chain. So for instance, this transaction through the provides tag can unlock some other transactions. So this 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 is used by the transaction pool uh, or the transaction queue to actually create uh, a graph, a dependency graph between the transactions. So um, if you are using frame and you are using account model, this actually relates to the account that is sending uh, the transaction and the nonce of the account. So let's say a transaction with nonce two will require a transaction from the same sender, but with nonce one. And this is what will be in this uh, require stack. Right, and then longevity, uh, we have this concept of like a mortal versus immortal extrinsic. Is this what that is? Uh, yes, and also it's a little bit, um, it's it's related, but it's not exactly this. So the the, the mortality of transaction uh, transactions affect longevity, which it, it, it means that the, um, the mortal transaction is is completely not valid after some point in time. Longevity is the, just telling the transaction queue that the valid validity of the transaction is is uh, uh, can is valid for this longevity period. So it means that the thing that you just produced uh, might change in ten blocks, let's say. So then the transaction pool uh, pool or queue will actually ask the runtime again after this longevity period. Oh, is it still valid? Uh, because th this might change over time. So if you have something that changes frequently, then you might say uh, that longevity is just one, and then every block, the transaction queue will actually uh, ask you again, is it still valid or not? Okay, and then propagate, this is, has to do with gossiping around the network? Yes, so there are there are a couple of cases where we uh, want to include that transaction, but we don't necessarily want to send it to everyone else. So let's say you found a, a you are a fisherman, and you found a, something that um, some misbehavior, then, okay, probably you want to distribute it to everyone. But if you are a validator at the, at the same time, then you don't really want to share some solution with everyone else, but rather you want to include your solution in the next block that you are creating. Right, because you want the reward or the block fee or whatever exactly. that you're going to get for that. If, 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 you, if you just propagate it, then everyone else can just see your result and just copy it over and send their own transactions. Yeah, sure. So. Uh, what different, like, what types of transactions are there in Substrate? Mm -hmm. So the, the transaction pool is dealing with transactions, but if you look at the at, at what we have in blocks, we actually store extrinsics in blocks because we divide extrinsics, so the things that are in the block, into two groups roughly. First one is uh, transactions, and the second one is inherents. And um, transactions are later on divided into signed transactions and unsigned transactions. Yeah, so that's like, it's like the pool only deals with transactions, but let's just talk about inherence for like just one minute. Mm -hmm. Like what is an inherent and how does it, how does the node deal with it when it's building a block? Mm -hmm. So inherent is something that is included in the block by the, by the validators. And um, we call them like validator opinions on stuff because there is no easy way to verify if, if uh, any of this stuff is correct. We can try to verify some stuff, but not everything because they usually come from like outside side world. And uh, validators are free to put whatever inherence they want in a, in a block, but obviously they it needs to be accepted by other uh, network participants. So let me just jump to an example. An example is uh, a timestamp module that we have in the frame, a timestamp palette. Um, it implements something that is called provide inherent. Here. Um, so we have a create inherent function, and this module is actually adding a call to set the timestamp of a block with a current, uh, with a current timestamp. Yes, and then that needs to be validated, but you can't really validate a timestamp the way that you can validate like a fund transfer because 
Like everybody's clock is a little bit different. Yes, but you can validate that the time, timestamp is increasing. So it's not lower than the timestamp in the previous block, let's say. Right. So like we so have a, this check inherent. inherent. Yeah. Exactly. And then we just look at, you know, is this, like, what's the logic here? Um, just to give like a real quick idea. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we get this inherent data uh, object, then we extract an uh, inherent of a particular type, and we make sure that the current timestamp set in that block um, is greater than the minimum timestamp time that, uh, that we want, I guess. Yes, so here in this part, we extract what you want to set the timestamp to, and then you check that the timestamp is actually greater than what is the, the previous step plus the max timestamp drift. Yeah, so um, yeah, so you need to do this for like every type of inherent that you have is like define some custom validation logic for it. Um, so now let's go to transactions. And mm -hmm. so like um, with transactions, we have this signed extension and that's like, that's how the runtime is like handing off this information to the transaction queue, right? Exactly. So, so as a as a developer, you don't really need to implement this valid transaction thing that we have shown earlier. But this is handled by the by the signed extension. So, a kind of like high level wrapper uh, to make it easy for you to provide this transaction validity. So, if we go to node runtime and we look for something that is called signed extra here, um, this defines a bunch of uh, signed extensions um, that are attached to every transaction that you are sending and that might do some validation or might uh, alter the result of validate transaction um, function. So for instance, um, let me jump to check nonce. This is defined in frame system. So if we go to frame system lib and look for check nonce. Mm. Uh, this is this is something that is attached to every transaction, and this will contain current um, a, a, an account nonce that is associated with that particular transaction. So what we do here, we check the account nonce from the from the state. So we see what is the next expected account nonce, and if it's different, then we either return that the transaction is stale, which means that. Um, it already has been included or some other transaction with the same nonce got in, or we say that it's a future transaction, which means that we see that it might be valid in the future, but we haven't seen all the transactions between expected and the current uh, one, a, a current nonce that is here. Um, when, everything valid, when everything is valid, then it actually updates the, the account nonce. Um, and you can see that this this check nonce is actually implementing a trait called signed extension, and this is where all the magic happens. So this trait uh, allows you to kind of hook into different phases of uh, transaction execution, or, or rather extrinsic execution, and affect what will happen. So the first one is called validate, and this is what will get called every time the transaction Q is trying to figure out if that transaction is valid or not. So you can see that we are doing a very similar logic to this pre-dispatch, and I will go back in a, in a short second um, to what I mean. But uh, we are taking this account nonce, we are checking if it's expected, and then it might be stale. But if it's valid, then we are trying to compute this requires and provides set. And um, for account-based, uh, systems, uh, you need to include one transaction to be able to include another transaction. So it means that the requires vector will actually require only the one that is right before it, right? So we take the um, the current nonce and we say, oh yeah, the, the we require the transaction with nonce minus one to be included in a blockchain first. Um, and we return this valid transaction object. And what happens is through every signed extension that you have that uh, alters this validate function, um, we, all, we combine those valid transaction objects that they return, and this is how we compute the, the overall uh, transaction validity, validity based on every extension that we write there. Yeah, so then, um, like, what does signed extension do with all of this now? Um, 
Yeah, so signed extension is just a way how you can easily uh, implement that logic because okay. we don't want we we want you to be able to kind of encapsulate a pieces of the logic that might be part, uh, might be relevant to only one of the palettes but not necessarily like you know every every runtime. So if you want to send your palette out and then your palette requires some additional validation logic then you just put it to your, or someone can put it to, to their signed extension, to the list of signed extensions, and uh, it automatically kind of plugs into this validation mechanism. Mm, I also like didn't go back to validate versus pre-dispatch, and this is like super important for all the runtime developers, because validate is being called by the transaction queue when it sees that transaction. It might be called multiple times, but then um, when we include a transaction in a block, we still need to do the same checks as we do in, in the validate. Um, by default, pre-dispatch is actually calling validate. So if you don't overwrite pre-dispatch function, you don't have to worry about that. You should focus on the validate function. But if you do, you need to do exactly the same checks as the validate transaction because this is executed when the extrinsic is being executed, so during block execution. and if uh, if you don't do that, so if we, let's say, remove this code here, uh, now transaction queue will not accept transactions with nonces out of order, but if you create a block with, uh, with a transaction that is out of order and you just propagate it over the network, so if you kind of craft this block outside of the, outside of the client without using the transaction pool, it will be accepted by everyone else because this pre-dispatch logic is what, what is being run uh, during block execution, not but, the validate function. But will the, the so the transaction will be accepted, but will it actually successfully execute, or will it still yeah. fail? Uh, it will. It will actually successfully oh, execute. Okay. Yes, because you have overridden uh, overwritten the checks that we do uh, before the transaction is being dispatched. If you if you change the validate function, then it's go not going to be accepted by the transaction pool, but it it uh, might be accepted by the by the block. So if we see it in the block, then we're gonna accept it. But pre-dispatch is we see it, we see something in a block. Yeah, if you remove everything from pre-dispatch, we see a transaction in the block and we don't really validate it. We only validate the transaction that is floating uh, uh, like a lone, standalone transaction floating in the network, but not when it's part of the block. If okay. That makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, so like um but so this is coming from like the system module within frame and it's like not something that most people would have to mess with, right? Yes, yes. But uh, since you can implement your own signed extensions, uh, because if we go back to this node runtime, this is not the only extension that we have. Um, so we have a bunch of extensions that are implemented by the frame system, which is, uh, yeah, check the version of the extrinsic, check that the genesis hash is matching so we don't have replay. Pro uh, so this is a replay protection between different chains. Uh, check that the error matches. So this is this mortality of the transactions that you mentioned earlier. Check nonce and check weight, for instance. Um, so this checks the the, the fees. Um, but we also have a transaction payment palette that is actually charging the the, the fees and the tips uh, that are included in the transaction. Yeah, and this all goes and this all gets wrapped into the signed extension. Yes. So this is pretty much. Uh, um, a collection of signed extension is also a signed extension. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we can go just look at like the signed extension trait and see all the mm -hmm. the parts of it. Um, I think it's defined in runtime slash traits. And let's look for signed extension. Yes. Okay. Here. Yeah. So. I think the most interesting stuff is the functions that we have. So yeah, we we have this validate function that I already kind of covered. Um, so this is what is uh, needed by the transaction pool to correctly validate the transaction and order them. So then, every yeah. so every function would have a signed extension with it, right? Or, uh, or every dispatch call. Yeah, yeah. So when you are when you are implementing a signed extension, there is a bunch of methods that you can override because we provide a default implementations. Yeah. So, so like so everything that you put in like a decal module, um, it would automatically have the signed extensions like functions generated for it. So any function that you're 
putting in, it's going to have all, all of these functions as part of the trait that you can call on it. Uh, Does that make say, sense? Say again. <laughs> I think I lost it. Like um, anything that you put in the deco module, um, so like some some API endpoint, uh -huh. um, these are like transactions that somebody could put in the pool, and you can call these functions with inside extension on any of these calls, right? It's inside an extension. Uh, so this happens before we dispatch the transaction. So what I think what you are speaking about is is the transaction dispatch. So we have a module. Let's let's just quickly jump to um, I don't know. Let's go maybe not online. Uh, let's go to timestamp module that we have mentioned earlier. So this module has a um, set function that you can call. Uh, you can't call it easily because it it requires the origin to be non, so it means that it has to be inherent or an unsigned transaction. Um, but uh, this is wrapped, so a call to this function is wrapped in an extrinsic, and then extrinsic has a bunch of signed extensions attached to it. Okay, but, that's what I meant. Okay, yeah, yes. that's the ex uh, not the dispatch, but the extrinsic has. Yeah. All of these signed extension functions that come with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's not the the that particular function having the signed extension attached. It's the signed extensions are attached for every extrinsic that might be wrapping a call to to that particular. Right. Module. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it at the beginning. Um, yeah. So let me go back to uh, traits. Uh, so yeah, we have this validate function that is used by the transaction pool. Then we have pre-dispatch that I've mentioned earlier, and you can see that by default it's actually calling validate. Right. So it's usually safe to just override the validate function. Um, then we have validate on signs, and this is something that we didn't really cover yet. Uh, but uh, I've mentioned that transactions can be divided into signed transactions and unsigned transactions. So um, despite the name, signed extensions are actually applied for both uh, kinds. So also for signed transactions and unsigned transactions. So if if we detect that the transaction is um, signed, then we go through validate function because you can see that we pass the account ID here. Uh, if we see that the transaction is unsigned, uh, validate unsigned from your signed extension will be will be called automatically. So if you have uh, if one of the modules have uh, some unsigned transactions that you might be uh, that you might want to enable to be to be callable uh, then you should put a, a signed extension that will validate those uh, those unsigned transactions to to that particular call to that particular module and uh, yeah this yes. unsigned set is is very similar so we have validate and we have pre-dispatch uh, post dispatch is um, whatever you want to do, after the transaction was being uh, was uh, was executed, was dispatched, um, and yeah, it might be some additional logic that you do, uh, given the result of the of the dispatch. Yeah, and by default, it just doesn't do anything. Yeah, yeah, and then what's the identifier? Um, I think this is something that is needed for the for the metadata and was okay. updated recently. All right. So that uh, whenever you are building a, a UI. And you want people to be able to, from your UI, you want to compose those transactions. But in theory, your UI is working with every possible runtime there. Uh, we have this metadata, metadata mechanism that is able to tell you what are the signed extensions for that particular runtime. So depending on the network you connect to, uh, your UI might be producing different kinds of transactions based on that metadata. Yeah. All right. Anything else to add to this? Um, I don't know. I think I think we covered everything. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs>